Okay, well, this morning, um, we kind of going to kind of continue about what we started last week on this series called The Prophet and You. And we're going to talk about Abraham this morning here in just a little bit. Mara's going to take over and speak for a bit, but when we study about the prophets and the word prophet uh, in the Hebrew language it's translated no, 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 no. the Hebrew word for prophet is the word Navi and that's the word we have in Hebrew written out here on the bottom of our sign Navi and the first time that word is used is in reference to Abraham uh, word Navi is the Strong's Concordance number 5030, or a prophetess is 5031 in the Strong's. And it's defined as a spokesman or inspired spokesman. And the characteristics include a, a specific calling to be a prophet slash spokesman or a specific assignment and work with faithfulness to abandon the common life and to, to obey the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, which is where we're supposed to be, according to Romans 8. We're supposed to be walking in the Spirit. So you want to hand me the book there, Mama? Just if I can read it. I might have to put my glasses. Take them off. Take them off. I can read them now. I think. Okay. The noun is found parallel to two other words, meaning a seer, a prophet, Samuel, uh, which tends to stress the visionary or perceptive aspects of a prophet's experiences. There were sons of the prophets, a phrase in indicating bands or companies of prophets, son in this case meaning a member. Sometimes they had a group of prophets around them, a prophet did. The prophets were designated from Israel and Jerusalem. An unusual development. David set aside some of the sons of Asaph, Hermon, and Jedithim to serve as prophets. Their prophesying was accompanied with musical instruments and possibly was brought on and aided by these instruments. This phenomenon is described mainly in the book of 2 Chronicles. Evidently, Zechariah the priest also prophesied in that area, er, era. But Moses himself desired that all God's people have the Spirit of God on them, as did the prophets. And that's in Numbers 11 29. Uh, fifth, Strong's Concordance 5031 for prophetess is the feminine noun for this uh, word. And it is a feminine form of Hebrews, Navi, meaning a spokesman, a speaker, a prophet. The ancient concept of a prophetess was a woman who had the gift of song, like Miriam or Deborah. A later concept of a prophetess being more in line with the concept of a prophet, one who was. One was one who was consulted in order to receive a word from the Lord, like Huldah. It also described a, a false prophetess, known to Leah, a unique message, a unique usage, may be its reference to the wife of Isaiah as a prophetess. Is this because of her own position? And work or because of a relationship with Isaiah, a prophet. It has been interpreted both ways. The Strong's are number 7200 and 2374. It uses the word seers because they had visionary, prophetic, and perceptive experiences. In Greek, uh, the Greek word in Strong's is 4396. Is prophetes, and it means to tell beforehand, 
and interpret possibly of dreams, interprets the will of God to men. The one who receives the oracle speaks under divine influence and inspiration, exhorting, reproving, and warning slash threatening as ambassadors. They were not ordained by a local church as a prophet had no successor in the New Testament. If Moses received a call from God to speak his words and perform a specific task with the promise that the Lord would be with him and help him accomplish it, accomplish it and then responded reluctantly, Moses saw God do what he said he would do. Moses' prophetic voice spoke to Israel of the past, present, and future, as did every major prophet after him and Abraham before him. This pattern is found in the case of every true prophet. All the true prophets stood in the counsel of God to receive their messages. They did not and should not read it off the internet. They heard the voice of the Lord for themselves. Yes. Mm. Can you give me those numbers for the seer? Okay. It is Strong 7200 and 2374. And I can hold it right. 2374. That's the Hebrew, right? Yes. Okay. The Greek word is 4396 in the Greek, Greek Strong's. You want to use what's on my computer, or are you going to do it? For what? What you're about to do. Yeah. It's right here. No, I want to take okay. it off the computer. All right. All right, mine's going to take it from here. Do you know how to use the coffee machine? Okay. Yesterday, Myra came down here and said, I want to put this, like a stage up here. Sure. And I didn't figure it out until just now. She wanted me to be jacked up. I think. <laughs> oh, my Good corn, Jack. Oh, <laughs> Had to get one in there. Yeah, <laughs> always. Good reason is. Yes. We like them. All right. Laughter's <laughs> good for the heart. That's pretty good. <laughs> that was our medicine for today, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe she wanted herself to be jacked up. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted to be taller than me. That's right. Now, this stage, the youth of our church, um, we well, Jack built it off of something that was donated to us. It was just the Lord speaking, and our youth decorated it under the rug. You can see where they mm -hmm. put a big cross on here and a bunch of splatters, and it's yellow. And so if we're going to keep it up here, we'll wrap it in something that looks nicer than this. But this was just a, in the dark last night while the power was out. This is wow. all we can accomplish. We yeah. came down here to do That's lots of things. Good. But yeah. <laughs> um, I um, really have a heart for the youth and children. And I mean, I just can't even express to you how much my heart is breaking for our children these days. And um, I really would appreciate your prayers to that end that... God will help us to be able to connect with children in our community because we have got to instill godly values and vision. Somebody said that this week, and I got up from my desk at work and wrote it on a whiteboard I have in there. We've got to instill godly values and vision because they're growing up with no vision of what life is supposed to be like, what the Bible promises. They have no idea for it of or vision, or an image, and it's up to us. I don't want to go to my grave and feel like I failed God on that. So, anyway, um, also, um, like Jack has said in times past, this is going to, what he said last week, this could turn out to be a really long series as we move through the prophets, trying to learn lessons and learn about prophets of the Bible and so forth. And um, so we would really like for some of you to be involved in that and put together some of the 
teachings like Jeffrey, maybe you could take the, the book of Obadiah and just delve into it and find out. We don't want to just find out what it says and read the book. You'll see what I'm, how I took it apart here. We're going to talk about the culture and what was the life like for the person and what was their family like, who was their family. And a lot of this you have to glean from other sources on the internet. It's not it's not all just laid out in the book of Obadiah. And as a matter of fact, I don't know if you know it, but there is a widow that Elijah ministered to who had sons and she was going to lose them because she was so much in debt. And that's Obadiah's wife. Jewish oral history says that was Obadiah's wife. And so there's a lot to learn. There's so much to learn. And so, but we don't want to just learn it for the knowledge. We want to figure out how does this apply to us? How, what can we take out of it to be more like the people that God has called us to be and fulfill our individual missions? Amen. So um, just pray about it, what you might like to do. If you have a favorite prophet that you want to spend some time in, I'll give you a list of the questions that Jack went through last week about the things we want to learn about them. I'll give you a copy of that so you can kind of have a guide to what to look for and that kind of thing. Please, there's no one in this room that shouldn't say, okay, I will take this opportunity and do one, at least one. Every single one of you have the capacity to do this. Well, let me say something to add to that one thing. Um, the, the prophets <clears throat> are just spokesmen. It's God speaking. Yes. And almost all the prophets, or what all the prophets, when they're speaking, God is tying in a message about the times. Some of them are about the times of this of writing, but they apply to today. They're applicable to the end times, our future times. So I, I want to say that it's very. Uh, uh, it's time consuming because you have to be able, like you said, you break it out in parts. Because one one is like he's correcting all these people or saying all these things. Then he's he's saying something different after he goes through the correction of, of certain ideas. So the prophets they're they're very uh, time consuming, but the reward of learning who these men, what God was speaking and saying, is so in, important. It goes to pass the milk into the meat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. That's good. It goes past the milk to the meat. So, um, since Abraham was the first mention of the word Navi um, or Navi, I don't know for sure how you say it. I know in English we always say Navi. Um, so we want to look at that because I've heard other teachers, and I still don't exactly understand this, but I've heard other teachers say that the first mention of something in the Bible sets a pattern that you can look for with other uses of that word. And so if he's the first Navi, um, and his name was actually, in, in English it would be, if you want to say prophet Abraham, I mean Abram, you would say, Navi Avram, in Hebrew, that's how you would say it. The, yeah. You would say Prophet Abraham, Abram. How do you spell Navi? N A V I. Mm -hmm. um, so, whenever I was studying this, I've been studying this for about three weeks, and I probably have 20 hours of time in this. Now, that would not be, if you're going to do Obadiah with the little minor prophets, you wouldn't spend 20 hours on it. Because Abraham actually, the story of Abraham takes up 13 chapters of Genesis. That could be a book all by itself. Mm -hmm. 13 chapters could be a book all by itself. Mm -hmm. So that's why I invested so much time. And if you were going to do Hosea, it's about that length, I think. Um, but I felt impressed, and I really can't even say that I answered this question within myself. I hope that after we I finish and we have some discussion, Jack's got some discussion questions that maybe all of us together can help each other really figure out how to answer this question because what God was impressing on me to look at Abraham for was about answering the call. Answering the call to be a prophet, to be evangelist, pastor, teacher, 
apostle, administration, benevolence, whatever your calling is, how do we answer the call? And so um, I wanted to tell you, just let me tell you the story of Abraham and some of his background, his family, things like that, that I could piece together. So Abraham lived in a city called Ur, and it was, it was called Ur of the Chaldeans. Now, Chaldeans is used in another place in the Bible in the book of Daniel when the king called for the magicians, astrologers, and Chaldeans. Mm. So they were some kind of, they were relying on as some kind of supernatural source of information and guidance. The people, so this is the environment that Abraham grew up in was where it was Ur of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans would have been one of the very, the major things that were going on. And a Chaldean was studied the skies. So they might have been studying the stars. They could have been studying the, as a matter of fact, who knows if the wise men might have come from that area that came to Jesus because they came from the east and they were like astrologers, three kings. Um, well, I don't know if it says three, actually. No, Jack is just, all the time <laughs> challenging us about all those little details we learned when we were children and whether they are actually from the Scripture or not. But um, anyway, so the, the, um, the city of Ur is about 50 miles south of Baghdad today. That's where it's located. About 50 miles south of Baghdad, Iraq. Um, <clears throat> so maybe Abraham... When I say the word maybe, that means I'm giving opinion or speculation. My, maybe growing up in an environment where people believed there was God, there were gods, and that those gods would speak to you and give you guidance through the skies or whatever it was. Maybe this kind of growing up believing that kind of conditioned him to be able to receive the call and, and, and realize God is speaking to me. When God said in Genesis 12, get yourself out of here. This is the one new man translation. From your country and from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make a great nation of you and I will bless you and make your name famous and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you and all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, as I went backed up into chapter 11, I found that a whole bunch of family information. So it's interesting that this says, get away from your family. It literally says, leave your family. That's part of it, okay? Yeah. He lived in Ur of the Chaldeans with his family. But it, if you can study deeply into this, it looks like that Abraham heard this while he was still unmarried. And young because then what happened was his father whose name was Terah Terah had three sons Abraham Nahor and <coughs> Haran Haran had three children their names were Lot Milcah and Sarah or Sarai at that time so what happened when, oh, so so the son named, they had three children, that son died. Mm -hmm. So you had Terah, the dad, Abraham, and Nahor left. So they took the three children. The three of them took the three children. So Lot went with the dad. Abraham took Sarah as his wife, and the other brother took Milcah as his wife. So if that happened, that means that, he must have still been young and unmarried, and there was 10 years age difference between them. So that was kind of odd for a man to be in his 20s and not married yet. Mm -hmm. Back then, I think. Um, so anyway, they, they had, and there were different moms. These, these children came by a different mom. It wasn't Abraham's mother's child, you know, grandchild. It was mm -hmm. a niece removed from him. Um, so anyway... It says that all this happened, and then it says that the dad took Abram and Lot and left Ur of the Chaldeans. 
So it almost sounds like the dad kind of got involved in Abraham hearing this calling. And the dad was trying to say when he could go and when he couldn't. And I suspect possibly that when Abraham first told his dad, hey, I heard God say this, that his dad might have felt like, felt trepidation about it, maybe about his son being so young and just leaving and going off by himself. So I think there was a delay there in obedience because of family interference, so to speak. Mm. Um, so, but, so what they did when they finally left was they went north from where I said about 50 miles south of Baghdad. And you have to remember they're on foot, right? They're on foot. At best, they had camels, right? So they walked about the distance from North Carolina to Pennsylvania. It must have taken months. And they would stop at the little towns. They had to stay near the water. Back in that day, they always had to stay near the water, near the rivers, because they had to have access to water. So they were walking up the Euphrates River is what it looks like on a map. Did you put the map up? Oh, thank you so much, Jack. So this is a map of what they did. Um, is that the same map? Well, anyway, here's Ur, way down here at the Persian Gulf. And um, they he walked... Basically, up the near the Euphrates River, up into this area, which is actually Turkey today. Think about it: from our, southern Iraq all the way to Turkey, walked. Syria. Syria. Okay. And um, when they got there, now Daddy's with them. Okay, so Abraham's not fully been able to obey to leave your family, right? So he's. His daddy's with them and the other brothers with them. And we know that because, so basically dad said, if you're going to leave, we're taking everybody. We're all going together. You're not going, we're not going to let you just go off. You know, we're, we're all going. And the reason we know the other brother was there is because later Abram sent his servant to go back to get a bride for Isaac. Year, many years later. And that's where he went to, Haran. So we know that the whole family left and came up there. Well, they stayed there. Maybe Daddy got too old. To, the trip was too hard for him or something. They stayed there. And after the dad died, that's when Abram said, God has said this to me, and I'm going to obey him. So Abram takes um, Sarah, who is his wife, and apparently Lot wanted to come with them, but the brother didn't come. So they start down this way. Now, Israel is right here. As you can see, this little body of water right there, that's the Dead Sea and the Jordan River and Galilee, Sea of Galilee. So he, he leaves right here, and he starts heading down on foot again, remember. And he comes, he just starts walking down through there. So um, so let's see where I'm at. By that time, Abraham had gotten a lot of wealth. So it's not just him walking. He had servants. He had cattle. He had gold and silver. He had done good business in Haran, which another point that I noticed is that the city Haran is the same name as the son who died, Haran. So mm -hmm. I don't know if this, I didn't look for historical proof on this, but it, it made me suspect that possibly the family named a place Haran after the sun, mm -hmm. and, because that would have been kind of an honorable thing to do. So maybe they went into Syria in a place that there was no people and actually named a place and began to do business and stuff. And they may have built that city. I don't know if that's true or not. But so um, Abraham, God had told Abraham to go, and I'll show you where to go. So he just starts walking south from there. And taking all his wealth and everything and all his servants and their children and wives and is becoming a tribe of people. And the first place he goes, as soon as he leaves, God begins to speak to him and renews the calling. God says again, um, I will give this land to your seed. And so, 
Abraham built a altar. And then it says that Abraham moved and he went on the east side of Mount Bethel. And he built another altar and he called on the name of the Lord or declared Yahweh is God. Then he went on south. I can't go through the whole story because 13 chapters, there's a whole lot here and a whole mm -hmm. lot of stuff happened. But Abraham did start walking the whole area. And in Genesis 13, 14 through 17, God said, put your feet all over the land, north, south, east, and west. Mm -hmm. Walk the whole thing. <clears throat> so this is his calling, is to come into an area that's actually inhabited by Canaanites and walk it. That's his calling. Walk it. Walk this land. I'm going to give it to your seed. Now, he had no seed, and he owns no land. This is huge faith. If you can put yourself in a position, if God said, go to Knoxville and walk around the entire perimeter of the city limits because I'm going to give it to you. And you're like, I can't buy this land. I'm not wealthy enough to buy the whole city of Knoxville. You know, it's kind of like he didn't even own it. He just walk it. Just go walk it, Abraham. Walk the whole thing. So he spends basically the rest of his life walking the land. So he sets up these altars and he digs these wells around the area. And... Um, later on, piecing things together his pilgrimage, he goes down into Egypt, he lies to Pharaoh and says Sarah's his sister. Pharaoh takes Sarah, he's going to basically abducts her, he's going to have her for a while, but they find out that he's lying, so they say, go on out of our land, why'd you do this to us? You can live wherever you want, just go, go away, give us a distance away from you. <laughs> And then, so he leaves and he goes up into the desert. And then uh, another time, he comes back, uh, he comes where there's a king, Abimelech, and who is once Sarah. And when oh. King Abimelech gets Sarah, and Abraham says the same thing, she's my sister, which I don't think it, the word in Hebrew for sister is actually sister. I think it means a female relative. Mm -hmm. Which was true. I think she yes. was. I yes. have sister is what my footnote in my Bible said. That's true. Yes, that's, that would be true. Well, it's actually a niece, a half niece. Mm -hmm. Because it was his, his brother was her father. The one that died was right. actually Sarah's father. Right. So it's a half niece. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you can check that out. And I'll give you some uh, scripture to check out the stuff if you want to. But... Um, so, the second time he does it is the first time God calls someone a prophet. He, Abraham tells Abimelech, it's my female relative. Abimelech takes her and he plans on she's going to be a, one of his wives. And listen to this. What happens? What verse were you at? Um... Hang on just a minute. Let me see here. I'll have to look up the exact place. That's um, because there's so much here. I didn't okay. write down every scripture reference. That's fine. Wherever Abimelech is. Oh yeah, I do have that scripture somewhere. Let's see. It's, okay, it's it's chapter 20, verse 7. So Abimelech wants her. This is what happens. You, you have to piece it all together because it doesn't say it the way I'm saying it so clearly to you. It has a piece here and a piece later. <laughs> but what happens is because Sarah is holy... She would be a prophetess. I would consider her to be a prophetess also. It never calls her that, but she's married to Abraham, and she is going to be the mother of this nation. She's holy because she's married to the prophet, okay? 
there's a distinction, you all, between somebody who's got a holy calling of God, and God will look, overlook a lot of mistakes that person might make for the calling. That's right. He will. Mm -hmm. And um, judgment comes on the house of Abimelech. Mm -hmm. All the women start having to stop being able to have babies. Mm -hmm. All the women stop being able to have babies. Judgment. A Abimelech, his wife and family and people come down with some kind of disease that sounds like leprosy. You know why? God said, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. Do you think it's a curse if somebody takes your wife? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So God begins to allow a judgment and a curse to come down on Abimelech's kingdom. In his house, nobody's having babies, and people are getting sick with leprosy. I'm just going to say leprosy. I don't know if it said leprosy. But anyway, so this is what happens. Abimelech understands that the gods, the gods plural, have power, right? Just like the Hindus and Buddhists do today. They believe that there's many gods and that they have power to do things. So Abimelech believes that this is from the gods. My house is cursed because something has gone wrong. Mm -hmm. And so he knows we would be better off in our lives if we would pay more attention to little things like that that God might be trying to speak to us. Because even these people who don't believe in Jesus understood that some things might be coming from God. So Abimelech goes and he figures out who is this woman? This started when this woman came in here. And he goes to Abraham and he says, no, no, wait, what it says in, in chapter 20, verse 7, well, 6 says, God said to Abimelech in a dream, I am, calling himself the God, I am, knows that you did this in the integrity of your heart. Meaning, you didn't mean to take a man's wife. You thought it was an unmarried woman. For I am also withheld you from sinning against me by doing this to Sarah. You would have been sinning against God. Yeah. And he says, therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet. Mm -hmm. First mention of the word prophet in the whole Bible. <laughs> and God tells it to a foreign king mm -hmm. about his man who has impossible odds of accomplishing that goal, that calling of going to give this land that you don't own to a seed you don't have, and says he's a prophet. Give his wife back. And then it goes on and it says, he's a prophet and he will pray for you and you will live. But if you do not restore her, know this, you will die. Mm -hmm. And everything that you own. That's powerful. That's God defending. And I've seen that happen in my life. Mm -hmm. I love when the scriptures I've relied on more than anything else is Isaiah 54, 17. Mm -hmm. Every weapon formed against you fails. 